as soon as Tech shows up, we'll cover what's new on the 1958 air conditioning system. Tech? Why, he was around just a minute ago. Over here, Raj. I was admiring the improved ceiling on this evaporator assembly and the blower housing insulation. That's really one of our big new advantages, Tech. Now, thanks to unitized construction, the evaporator, heater core, and housing are assembled and sealed before they're installed. That means hot air leaks will no longer get into our hair. Sounds good. Any other improvements? Yeah, Toby. Output of the blower has been poked up 15%. So more cool air is now delivered inside the car. Yeah, and besides that big boost in blower output, a distribution duct adapter is used for more effective air distribution. It's in addition to the air duct and directs cool air better, especially to the rear of the car. Say, those benefits are all well and good for our customers, but how about us technicians? What's been done to make service any easier? Coming right up, Toby. Here's a story. The expansion valve and thermal switch are now located on the outside of the evaporator housing. You certainly can't beat that for accessibility. As a matter of fact, there are no moving parts nor any electrical connections inside the evaporator housing that should require attention. Hey, that's good news. Service is going to be easier. Uh, suppose we talk about service, fellas, starting with a brief review of the system. Then you'll know what test to use when a system needs attention. Good suggestion, Tech. Now, take the compressor, for instance. It's the circulator, like the human heart. It pulls refrigerant gas under low pressure from the evaporator, compresses it, and sends hot, highly pressurized gas to the condenser. At the condenser, heat from compressed refrigerant gas is transferred to outside air flowing through the condenser fins. In the process, refrigerant is condensed. It changes from a gas to a liquid. From the condenser, the liquid refrigerant passes through the receiver dryer strainer. Now here's where the moisture is removed from the system. Right. Then the liquid refrigerant goes to the expansion valve and evaporator. The expansion valve, a metering device, controls flow of refrigerant into the evaporator. The evaporator works like a radiator in reverse. It has a lot of coils through which the liquid refrigerant flows. Air is directed over the coils. Liquid refrigerant inside the coils absorbs heat from the air that circulates over the coils. As heat is absorbed, the liquid changes to a gas. The expansion valve regulates flow, so the evaporator coils are never starved nor flooded. It sees that continuous and complete vaporization takes place under all operating conditions. Now, a magnetic clutch automatically connects and disconnects the compressor drive. Clutch engagement is controlled by a thermal switch. The thermal switch gets its temperature signals from the evaporator. What kind of temperature signals, Raj? Well, just before the evaporator gets cold enough to frost over, the thermal switch opens the clutch circuit. As the evaporator warms up, the thermal switch closes the circuit and engages the clutch again. I see. Okay. Now, when a unit comes in for service, always check belt deflection. It should be 3 eighths inch with a 9 to 12 pound pull. If that's okay, start the engine to see if the compressor is being driven. Check the sight glass next. Bubbles mean a low refrigerant supply. Also, make sure the condenser fins aren't cluttered up, restricting airflow. In addition, Check the lines to see that they aren't kinked. That would restrict flow of the refrigerant. Okay, Tech. Anything else to check? Yeah, Sherm. On models using a dry eye, a blue element means no moistures in the system. Pink means you'll have to dry it out before going to other tests. Okay. Now, suppose we find those things all in apple pie order. Then what? Check the controls. Turn the blower on. See if it delivers plenty of air start the engine. Put the temperature control lever in cold position. The fresh air door should be closed. The recirculating door open. The clutch should be engaged and the water flow valve closed tightly. How can you tell for sure whether the water valve's closed? 
The best way to tell that is to remove the heater hose from the outlet connection. No water from the core means the water valve is closed. But watch it, boys. You gotta be careful. If the engine's hot and the cooling system's under pressure, coolant may come pouring out of the hose. So make that test with the radiator cap off and before the engine gets hot. Okay, I'll watch that. You also want to check control operation with the temperature lever moved 3 8 inch to the right of cold, the position for maximum fresh air cooling. Now, with the lever there, the fresh air door should be open. Recirculating door closed clutch engaged, and the water flow valve should still be closed. If all those things take place, then the controls are okay, right? In general, yes. It's not a complete check, but you'll know the controls are doing what they should to provide maximum fresh and circulated air cooling. All right. Now, where do you go from there? Well, if a customer thinks he ought to get more cooling, a performance test will tell if the unit does what it's designed to do. Occasionally, the owner may expect too much on humid days. Oh, then some owner education is involved. It is where humidity is concerned. Also, if an owner tries to compare car air conditioning with whatever air conditioning he's got in his home. Good point, Tech. Homes certainly carry more insulation. Attics and walls insulate better than a steel roof and steel and glass sides. Homes have a glass area of about 10% cars have 40 percent. Besides that, homes are easier to cool. They've got no big furnace going while a car engine develops a lot of heat. And what's more, a home stays put partly in the shade and on a cool foundation. A car moves over hot pavement, picking up ground heat as well as getting a hot sunblast all over. In other words, owners should know the practical limit of a car air conditioning unit. Now, owners aren't the only ones. I'd like to know about that practical limit myself. Okay. Always remember that humidity, the amount of moisture in the air, has a big influence on how much cooling you can get. And this is true of all air conditioning systems, whether in the home, office, or car. Well, why is that, Raj? Well, when the air is humid, the evaporator has the double job of lowering temperature plus wringing out the moisture. Condensing water takes so much evaporator energy that less is available for cooling. For example, when it's 90 degrees outside and humidity's high, say 100%, the evaporator can deliver 74 degree air. But when it's 90 degrees and the air is dry, the evaporator can deliver 55 degree air at the distribution duct. That difference of 19 degrees between the 55 and 74 shows how much humidity affects cooling. I see what you mean, Raj. Here's something else, Sherm. The number of people in a car also affects the cooling job because body heat and perspiration add an extra load on the evaporator. So, even though there is a low temperature at the outlet duct, the owner's thermometer swinging from the dome light can tell a different story. Owners must understand this, too. I get the general idea, Tech. In fact, my wife always talks about how long her wash takes to dry on a damp, hazy day. On a dry, sunny day, the clothes dry a lot easier. She's right. Humidity's working against her there. So remember, when the air's dry, it's easy to lower temperature. But on humid days, there's a lot of condensation to take care of in addition to cooling. So never overlook humidity when you check air conditioning performance. Don't worry, Tech. We'll keep that very much in mind. Swell. Now, if somebody will please turn the record over, we'll cover more vital facts on air conditioning. Now, finish your visual check of the system and controls before you test performance. Be especially sure no water flows to the heater core. That performance test tells if an owner's complaint is due to high humidity or below standard operation. Then if the system's doing all it can, you won't waste time looking for trouble. And when you do test performance, always allow for humidity by taking wet bulb as well as dry bulb readings. The wet bulb thermometer is cooled by evaporation. But don't get the notion that wet bulb temperature is humidity. 
It's just another way to show how humidity affects temperature. Hey, Roger? Right. When humidity is low, wet bulb temperatures will be much lower than dry bulb temperatures. When humidity is high, wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures will be closer together. Right on the nose, Rog. And any time both readings are the same, humidity is exactly 100%. The performance table in this reference book also allows for humidity. It tells how cold delivered air should be for any combination of wet bulb and dry bulb readings. Performance test details are in the book. Well, we've made that test before. We can certainly do it again. Accuracy is still important, Toby, as Raj can tell you. Oh, yeah. Use this psychrometer for quick and accurate wet bulb, dry bulb readings. A motor-driven fan directs air over two dial thermometers. One thermometer is covered by a cotton sock suspended in water. Looks right handy, Raj. You'll like it, Sherm. Now, be sure to check discharge pressures as you make your test. And they can provide clues to possible trouble. For instance, pressures vary with temperature. This reference book table shows what discharge pressures should be. Suppose we find abnormal pressures. Why, abnormally high discharge pressures mean too much refrigerant, air in the system, or restricted airflow through the condenser. Abnormally low discharge pressures mean too little refrigerant, moisture in the system, too much compressor oil, or leaking compressor valves or gaskets. But don't disassemble the compressor before you test it. And we'll talk about this test a little later. In the meantime, remember to test the thermal switch so you'll know if it is cycling the clutch properly. Good point, Tech. That's an important test. A faulty switch or poor sensing bulb contact will cause the evaporator to frost over. That restricts airflow so it won't cool. The expansion valve will try to stop refrigerant flow. That, in turn, will cause abnormally low suction pressures. Another thing, if the clutch remains continuously engaged and suction pressure remains high, that points to moisture in the system, an open expansion valve, or to faulty compressor valves. So pressure is really helping diagnosis. Right. Now, if compressor pressures are OK, check wet and dry temperatures. From the performance chart, find out what discharge air temperature should be. Yeah, and if the unit isn't cooling down enough, you'll have proof that something is wrong. And it's not just humidity or the owner's imagination. Right. As an example, fellas, there might be hot air leaks or poor refrigeration. To check leaks, remove the blower rubber coupling. Funnel in about a pint of water and watch for leaks at the grommets. A stream of water means there are hot air leaks. To correct, use heavy body sealer at the grommet and around the entire outside edge of the housing. Clutch slippage could also cause poor refrigeration, but it's easy to test. Just paint a one-inch white mark across both elements and unhook the feed wire from the thermal switch to the clutch. Connect a jumper from the clutch to the battery and connect a timing light to the ignition coil secondary cable terminal. Start the engine. Set idle at 500 RPM. Put the blower on high. Also cover the condenser to raise compressor discharge pressure to 300 pounds. There should be almost no creep between the two white marks at 300 pounds pressure. A slight creep during starting should settle down to no more than one revolution per minute. And if we get more than that? More than one RPM slippage is too much. Check clutch plate clearance. It should be 15 to 20 thousandths. And see if terminal and brush contacts are good. If clearance and contacts are OK, then install a new clutch assembly. OK, Raj, will do. Anything else? Well, we're still not sure about the expansion valve or the compressor. But won't suction and discharge pressures tell you if the compressor's doing OK? Not always, my boy. Variations in pressures may only mean there are other restrictions in the system. You've got to isolate the compressor and test its capacity to be sure. Right as rain, Tech. To make that capacity test, oil in the system must collect in the compressor to provide enough lubrication for good compression. So run it 15 minutes at 1,200 RPM with blower on high. After that, close both the suction and discharge service valves. 
Well, that isolates the compressor and lets you run it as an air pump. Run it that way at exactly 500 RPM. While the suction side of the compressor is wide open, air pressure developed will show on the high pressure gauge. The only opening on the discharge side is in the test cap you install at the manifold center connection. Measuring discharge pressure developed against flow through the test cap orifice will tell you if the compressor delivers adequate volume. The reference book has all the compressor test details you need, along with different standards for the model you may be checking. Good deal, Tech. I suppose we can always install a new compressor if it fails the test. You try that, Toby, and I'll blister your hide. A compressor that fails the test usually needs only gaskets and valve plate assemblies. You can replace those parts without dumping the refrigerant. Good advice, Tech. Low capacity is rarely caused by a compression leak past the pistons. So let's just replace gaskets and valve plates when necessary and do the job right. Okay, okay. I'll tow the line. Good. And remember, you ought to test compressor capacity before blaming the expansion valve. And where the expansion valve is concerned, you can test that while it's still in the system. It's a flow valve, as you know. How much refrigerant it feeds into the evaporator depends on temperature and pressure of the refrigerant leaving the evaporator. Testing the expansion valve, by the way, is easy. Use a tank of refrigerant to supply a controlled refrigerant of 70 pounds pressure to the expansion valve by way of the manifold gauge set. Refrigerant flow from the valve is restricted by the compressor capacity test cap you install on a T-fitting at the suction hose side of the gauge set. Put the valve sensing bulb in 32 degree ice water. That should move the valve diaphragm into minimum flow position. There should be 21 to 24 pounds suction pressure with 70 pounds discharge pressure. Remove the bulb from the water and warm it up with your hand. Suction pressure should increase to at least 53 pounds. That means the valve's opened enough for full refrigerant flow and full cooling. If you don't get those suction pressures, replace the expansion valve. But don't forget to maintain 70 pounds pressure on the valve during this test. Pretty neat test, Tech. And one we sure can use. Right. Now, one possible cause of erratic cooling performance is moisture in the system. The dryer may be saturated, so it releases water during hot weather, which causes expansion valve freeze-up. On a dry eye, you can see if the system is wet. To dry it fast, purge the refrigerant and replace the dryer. Pull vacuum down to at least 28 inches. Hold that for two minutes and then recharge the system. Trying to bake water out of a saturated dryer won't do. It can carbonize compressor oil inside. That will coat the dryer particles and they'll never work. Then replacing a wet dryer is the smartest move, huh? Usually, Sherm. There's another method for borderline cases. You'll find those tips plus more good information in the reference book. Okay, Rod. Sherm and I will really dig into that. Bad a boy. And everybody ought to take an early look at these improved 58 units. The more we know about them now, the better we'll service them this summer. Ha <laughs>